Welcome to this webinar, SRT Hypnotherapy for Misophonia. That's the sequent repatterning therapy for misophonia. I'm Tom Dozier. I'm a, the director of the Misophonia Treatment Institute, and I'm a behavior scientist who's been working in studying uh, misophonia and misophonia treatment, and the main presenter and developer of the sequent repatterning uh, therapy is Chris Pearson, and he is going to be presenting today. He's a hypnotherapist in uh, Yorkshire in the UK. So I'll start by giving you kind of a brief uh, overview of, of misophonia and a particular characteristic that makes sequent repatterning effective. What we have found uh, it, it, what I've discovered over the last three years and identified is that what you experience in misophonia is you hear a trigger and then you have this extreme emotional response. That's no secret, right? That is no secret at all, and that's, that is the hallmark of misophonia. What I have, and Chris and I both have identified, is that there's something more that what's actually happening here is that you're you're hearing the trigger and that's causing a physical reflex and then that physical reflex causes the extreme emotions or is, is a key contributor to it you know it's a bit like when you have the nails on the chalkboard you feel that trigger you feel it internally and it's this physical reflex that is a key in maintaining misophonia and it's a key in the sequent repatterning to be able to effectively address the extreme emotions and what you're experiencing uh, with misophonia. What I found in my work is that over 95 percent of the people in a therapeutic environment situation can identify the physical reflex and the physical reflex can be virtually any muscle in the body. Um, I had one woman who was using a cell phone and when I, I did the test, she says, oh my goodness, I almost dropped my cell phone because her reflex was opening her hand. Uh, I have another person, several people who, <gasps> they gasp for breath and that becomes a, an involuntary reflex, but it can also be reflexes, internal stomach constrictions, nausea, butterflies, uh, esophagus constriction. Uh, I've had a, a couple of individuals who get the sensation of an urge to urinate. And sometimes you can't identify exactly what that physical feeling is, but they hear the trigger and then there's this physical jolt and that jerks the extreme emotions. So let's see, I think that, I think that is the extent of my presentation, Chris. So now it is over to you as the presenter, Chris. Thank you, Tom. Well, hello to our audience. And as we move forward, I'm going to speak about sequent repatterning. I'm going to talk about where we are now and perhaps a little bit about how we got here and then where we're going to go next. very much a transitional process, which is uh, my intention with the photograph here, um, from one of discomfort towards an easy relationship with those stimuli that we call triggers. But just now we're going to look at what is sequent repatterning, where it came from, how it was developed, how well it works in practice, but also how it works. We're also going to then look at the next steps that we might take. The next steps that we'll look at involve the therapy that we deliver to individuals, how it is now, how it may develop, the therapists who will do that delivery, and how we will train those therapists. And then we'll end by looking at the research that we might need to do in order to validate what we're doing. So what is sequent repatterning 
therapy. Well, the word sequent has a number of alternatives, if you like, but all of them are very similar. It means that things happen in an order. They happen one after the other. And very importantly, even though some of them may be repetitive to a certain extent, it enables us to follow a process. And what we're doing in this process is very much to ensure that we logically defeat each of the elements that make metaphonia what it is. And generally, we speak of sequent repatterning as being a five-step process. So, we've covered sequent. What about patterning? Well, patterns are something that repeat, and they give something a very distinctive, sometimes almost unique character. And it's very important to realize that with patterns of behavior, each time that they're activated, they produce more or less the same result. In fact, given the same circumstances, the result will always be the same. So a pattern of behavior that is established because of an issue will always have the same outcome. And it's almost as though there's a part of us, almost like a, a program that runs each time that happens. We developed sequent repatterning as a response to there being no effective therapy room based treatment for misophonia that I was aware of. I began working with clients with misophonia several years ago. And as I have freely said, the first individual that I encountered who had misophonia stumped me. I had no idea what was really wrong with him. And it provoked a process of discovering more and more about misophonia. As part of what I do, I supervise the practice of a number of other therapists in this part of the world. And over a period of time, what happened was that each of those encountered somebody who quite obviously had misophonia and for which they felt poorly equipped to deal. And together, we increased our knowledge base over a period of time and began to work on ways that we might be able to help these particular individuals in an effective way. We knew that in some instances, hypnosis had been used, but that it was of fairly limited use because the effects of it didn't endure and that any benefits usually to all intents and purposes wore off fairly quickly. What we've developed is a combination of techniques. It does use hypnosis and hypnotherapy, of course, is a person focused therapy, but it is also quite strongly results oriented. So we use the hypnotherapy as the backbone of sequent repatterning. But what we don't do in sequent repatterning is to endeavor to remove any behavior or any feelings. What we do is we look to replace them with something that is more beneficial and quite obviously more resourceful. So there are no black holes left behind where previously there was a feeling and now there's nothing, just an emptiness. We replace it with something which is more desirable. And to do that, we use some of the techniques that are familiar in neuro-linguistic programming. And one of the keys to that, for instance, is the NLP anchoring technique. In some instances, we do use meridian therapies, and that includes those based on acupoints, the acupuncture and acupressure, and also EFT, which itself is a meridian therapy. And that really is the choice of a therapist to decide whether or not to employ those for individuals. 
So how well does it work? Well, here we have a, a graph that uh, Tom prepared from my own findings. And this shows some of the very early findings of an initial group of 13 individuals. Now, during that time, I think we had no real concept of this perhaps becoming a standalone technique for treating misophonia. And therefore, some of the cases weren't possibly quite as well documented as they might be in terms of the metrics that we show here. So some of the cases, as you can see, don't have some of the individual measurements included. But the general impression of this graph is of a group of 15 individuals who improved over a period of therapy. For those that we followed up, we did discover that those who continued practicing NLP anchoring, especially at that time, and also self-guided relaxation techniques were more likely to maintain the degree of benefit that they achieved during the therapy. And as you can see here, one of the clients, in fact, came back for more therapy after the conclusion of this program. And this group here includes all of those who continued with their daily personal maintenance, which is NLP anchoring and also self-guided relaxation and calmness exercises. And as you will very certainly see here, the relief that these individuals benefited from is far greater than those who simply concluded their therapy and then just went back to living their lives as they had been before. In fact, in several cases, it seemed that uh, the reacquisition of those uh, triggers was quite significant. When we move into the next group of uh, individuals, we see that, again, there has been a significant decrease in their MAQ scores. And here we have begun to use the MAQ2 document, um, which rates the severity of misophonia between 0 and 63. So as you can see, at least one of these individuals was suffering from an extreme degree of uh, discomfort, and several of them moderately severe, for sure. We generally reckon that uh, the score of 20 is the beginning of the cutoff towards a subclinical manifestation of misophonia. So anybody who achieves a score of less than 20 is experiencing very significant reduction in the triggering that they uh, may have previously had. What we see here is that most of the clients were able to continue with a reduced level of triggering. Um, the follow-ups have been done between around about six and nine months. And of quite obviously, the reason that uh, we've no longer term information about that is because those individuals only completed their therapy during mid to late 2014. Of those, we can see that there are a, a group who quite obviously have continued around the, the same level as when they concluded therapy. Personally, I feel that uh, a vari variation of MAQ score of three, four, even five is likely to be attributable to measurement error, to the, the noise of measurement of these kinds of things. And possibly even in one case uh, here, it may be that the 
the process has been less effective than perhaps with some of the others. But we can still see that the degree of relief was probably quite significant. And we know from the individuals concerned that they certainly felt much better at the conclusion of therapy, that their subscore, the sub subjective units of distress, showed that they had a better quality of life, whatever it may have been that they recorded on their MAQ score. And here we're really measuring two complementary but slightly different uh, uh, metrics. Um, this case number nine here was somebody who was unavailable to uh, gather any follow-up information from. So we've seen how well it works. So let's see how it works. Well, Tom mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that some kind of stimulus, we usually say a sound, but it can be any kind of sensory input. It can be a smell, it can be a feeling, it can be a sight, or it can be a sound. It creates in the individual an output of an emotional state that may include the flight, fight, stimulus, or can do the fight or sorry, the fight or flight response. Um, but whatever it is, it seems to be the output that is caused by this trigger. Now, what Tom discovered and what I independently discovered is that there is a conditioned reflex, very often a skeletal muscle reflex, um, which occurs, which is provoked by the trigger. Now, I may well have never noticed this if it hadn't been for having one client who, like Tom's lady with her cell phone, would drop anything that she had in her hand when she was triggered. And that included anything from a pen or a pencil through to a cup of coffee. It made life very difficult for her. But it was obviously a very strong physical reflex that she endured. It's also true that this part of the process occurs without the individual really knowing about it. Now, it is true that there is some dissent about whether we should use terms like the limbic system or indeed even lizard brain. But the fact remains that whatever your point of view on that may be, this all happens before we become consciously aware of it. The stimulus or the trigger causes a physical reflex before we know it's happening. We can say, I think, without any doubt whatsoever, that those elements occur in the subconscious domain. So asking somebody to take control of it, to turn it down a little bit, is really just quite useless because it's happening before they even know that it's begun. That physical reflex itself provokes the emotional response. This again is a response that is practiced. The more it's practiced by repetition, the stronger it usually becomes. So the fact remains that for misophonia, there are three functional components and two linkages. So how do we address those by using sequent repatterning? The first thing that we do is to use techniques to direct the feeling of that reflex, the reflex itself, in fact, towards a positive emotional state. We create a new link. And this new link ensures that whenever that reflex is felt, the individual experiences a positive outcome, a positive emotional state. And that's something which is beneficial and resourceful. It also, by sending that output to a 
newly acquired link ensures that the reflex is disconnected from the link to the emotion itself. Our next step is to associate the trigger itself, the sensory stimulus, with a calm emotional state. And again, we can do this by beginning with something which is quite a, a neutral response and allowing the individual to begin to take control of that feeling that they have when they encounter that particular stimulus, the trigger. And this is a process that can be repeated, it can be practiced until it becomes automatic. Now I said earlier that this part of the process is very deeply in the subconscious realm, the subconscious domain if you like. And it is true that anything that we do in life which is repeated, is practiced until it becomes automatic, becomes a responsibility of our subconscious. So therefore, if we take, for example, a concert pianist, they are concerned at a conscious level about what it is that they're playing, about their interpretation of that particular piece. They are not concerned with the mechanical and energetic issues surrounding fingers on the keys on a keyboard and so on. What they appear to be doing physically seems effortless almost, it seems easy. But it is true that anything that we practice enough to become automatic, to become a part of our subconscious, does seem to be easy. And therefore it's important that we ensure that this happens. That when we encounter that stimulus, the calm emotional state is automatically achieved. What we discover next is that these links begin to fade away simply because they have no use, their power and their activity reduces. We do do some work on these links and we begin to look at how they work, how the individual parts of our personalities link to the links and we begin to find other things for them to do if that is indeed necessary. And uh, that's something that we can possibly discuss later or on another occasion. But what we are left with here is a red box with the word emotion written on it. And that is violent, significant emotions. That is rage, it is anger, it is disgust, and all the other feelings that are sometimes associated with misophonia. And what we do is we leave these to the appropriate stimulus on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not sure that anger is a necessary emotion, but it is certainly something that we all experience from time to time. And when there's a reason, it's probably okay for us to be angry. When there's a good reason, it's okay for us to feel disgusted. But that should have nothing at all to do with this stimulus over here. It shouldn't be associated with somebody sneezing, sniffing or chewing. So this here becomes a self-contained and very natural response. So where do we go from here? We have several options and each of those will influence one area of how sequent repatterning might go forwards. The first is the therapy. We have very certainly now come to a point where sequent repatterning is established and we are beginning to measure just how effective it can be. With any psychotherapy, we have to take into account each individual's requirements and the differences between individuals can be quite significant. So throughout the process, although we have a structure 
of what we're going to do, the precise manner of its delivery is variable and will also suit the individual. There are some areas that we may even deliver to one individual that might not be necessary in another. But certainly the five steps of the process are part of each individual's experience of this sequent repatterning. What we do is to replace patterns of behaviour and not to remove them. With the therapy, we not only require somebody to provide the therapy to, but we also need someone to provide the therapy. At the moment, this picture shows more people than we have available to develop, uh, to deliver sequent repatterning therapy. Until relatively recently, I was alone in providing sequent repatterning. And a few weeks ago now, Mags Booth, also uh, based in the UK, completed her training and has begun treating patients with misophonia. So that doubled our resource, but uh, obviously the number was still quite low, being just two. Now that number will be increased by 50% around the end of this month when I will be training a therapist coming from the Netherlands to uh, um, become a sequent repatterning therapist. And from that point onwards, we are very much hoping, in fact, it is our intention to begin to roll out training to a much wider range of experienced therapists. And it is very much our hope that by the time we come to the misophonia conference in Chicago in October, that we will have as many therapists as there are faces in this photograph on the slide at the moment. So who is it that we might train? Well, certainly those that we train should be those with a practical experience of hypnosis in a therapeutic environment. And that's very important. We want to train therapists who are practicing currently. And we also want to ensure that they are properly qualified in hypnotherapy. In the UK, that should mean at the least holding a diploma in hypnotherapy and quite probably being a member of at least one of the professional bodies, either the uh, General Hypnotherapy Register or the National Council for Hypnotherapy. In America, I think that equates to being a board certified hypnotist. The individual should also have appropriate third party and professional indemnity insurance, of course, but they should also be trained and practiced in timeline therapy and to be trained and practiced in NLP. And again, as a minimum, I think we'd be looking at a, a practitioner diploma in NLP. Additionally, they should have a thorough working knowledge of misophonia, although we do very much address that as part of the training. So somebody with a genuine interest in misophonia would obviously be welcome. The training is at the moment being delivered on a one-to-one -one basis with therapists in a workshop format. Um, and the idea is to roll this forward to a classroom-based training course over two days, which will probably be to relatively small groups of therapists. The training at the moment, workshop or classroom, leads to a certificate of completion of the course uh, and also to an opportunity to register an interest with the Misophonia Treatment Institute. Subsequent to the training, there is an opportunity to complete some casework to complete reports and reflection on that casework and to become accredited by the Misophonia Treatment Institute and to be associated with the Institute into the future. 
In terms of the research that we need to do, this really splits into two areas. The first is to begin to build a strong evidence base from the information that we have from the cases that we treat. Now, as there become more therapists available to provide the therapy, we also will be able to establish that this is a therapy that is independent of the person delivering it and is based upon the techniques involved. It's certainly important that we are able to demonstrate that those we treat do benefit from it. And so far, that seems to be very much the case. But we also need a very strong scientific basis on which to take forward sequent repatterning. And therefore, we need to conduct sound scientific research. We also will quite obviously need research partners. We need to be able to validate that the techniques that we use do have a sound scientific basis. And that's something that can only be done in the future. So that really brings me to the end of this short presentation. I thank you very much for listening. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can do so by email to chris at chrispearson.co.uk. I have a website at www.chrispearson.co.uk where there is also a contact form. The Sequent Therapy site at sequenttherapy.com is available and in the process of being expanded. And of course, there is the misophoniatreatment.com website, which is now a reliable resource for therapists and sufferers of misophonia alike and is quite extensive, really. So with that, I will hand the ball back to Tom to wrap up this session and uh, we'll be taking some questions and answers very soon. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I think now let's go ahead and enter any questions you have into the uh, Q&A box or our chat window. Either one will be able to see Q&A probably will work best. So go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A box and we will uh, have those be able to answer your questions. First question, Chris, is can one learn to self-hypnotize with sequent therapy? Anyone can benefit from self-guided hypnosis or self-hypnosis as uh, some may call it, although the the process of sequent repatterning is very much about changing the patterns of behavior using a number of therapeutic tools. So the hypnosis is a consistent element of the process, but it is not the whole process. So I would suggest if you wanted to learn self-hypnosis, there are probably other uh, other resources that you could use to become proficient at that. And I do provide MP3 recordings and sometimes CDs for clients who want to continue with the hypnotic work outside of the sessions and some of them find that very useful. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, would it be possible to administer the hypnotherapy via audio only. My daughter is camera shy and afraid she might, and I'm afraid she might not be able to relax in front of a camera. The answer to that is it is very difficult to conduct hypnotherapy without being able to see the client. As a therapist, I look for <clears throat> quite often very subtle changes in the appearance of a client and I also need to monitor their responses. Um, some of the work that we do requires questions to be answered and with many individuals they prefer to use signalling rather than speaking. So I would, I think, probably discourage the use of audio only. 
But that said, it is very easy to set up VC so that there is perhaps no evidence of video at the um, at the client end, so that it is possible for me to monitor. Um, and certainly, if we are dealing with somebody who is uh, a younger person who might be disturbed by that, we need to uh, obviously speak to the responsible adults involved as well. So we do need to fairly constantly monitor the, the individual. There are all kinds of uh, signs and monitoring um, that are important, from, from breathing to facial expressions to muscle tone. And each of these is uh, um, is, is really quite quite important. I've experienced on one occasion of uh, working with a client who had no lights on, and it was around about sunset. And as the session continued, it gradually got darker and darker, and eventually became really impossible to continue with the session in a useful kind of a way. Okay, so we have another question here. Have any complications arisen while attempting to be put in a trance state for therapy using BC or web chat as opposed to in person? The answer to that is no. The, the common belief that somebody can be placed into a hypnotic trance and then somehow become stuck there is grossly overstated almost to the point of it being an impossibility. Hypnosis is about being very deeply relaxed. Deep hypnosis is about being even more deeply relaxed, but it's no different physiologically or indeed psychologically to being asleep. Certainly, I tell everyone when we begin hypnosis that it's a bit like daydreaming, and indeed, that is exactly the way it feels. If we lose contact during a VC or a Skype call, two things will happen. One is that the client will wonder why it's gone rather quiet and will open their eyes to find out what's going on. That is, they will reawaken. And the other is if they are very, very relaxed and possibly a little tired, they will drift into sleep. They will have a nap for however long they need one, and they will reawaken just as if they'd settled down for uh, a quick nap anyway. Um, the only other aspect of hypnosis is in the instance of what is usually referred to as an ab reaction, which is where all in terms of purposes, somebody becomes upset, and that is usually dealt with in very much the same way remotely as it would be um, face to face. Certainly, when I have a client who needs reassurance, I do it uh, verbally. Uh, I don't need to uh, to hug them or um, in any other way interact with them in a way that I couldn't do online. Okay, here we have a, another question. Are, are you ready for the next question, Chris? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay, comment about re a comment about research evidence. You have such a wonderful opportunity to evaluate this therapy scientifically and build a robust evidence base. I'm therefore concerned to see you linking hypnotherapy with meridian therapies. The research evidence or acupuncture, et cetera, is uncertain at best. I don't know about the evidence base for hypnotherapy. Could you comment? I will begin by mentioning the meridian therapies. We find that many individuals benefit from meridian therapies, and I certainly feel that our use of for instance, EFT, which is a validated technique, although perhaps not scientifically proven, is very useful. I use EFT a huge amount with individuals who perhaps don't have the confidence to make positive changes in their lives. We give them all the tools. In the therapy session, they feel very confident. 
They then return to their everyday lives and they really lack the confidence to put those things into practice. EFT, which is a meridian therapy, is an excellent way of allowing them to develop that additional confidence and to make the changes that they desire. As far as hypnosis is concerned, there are certainly research programs which show that hypnosis is effective, that it is certainly in the UK, for instance, it is the the preferred therapy for irritable bowel syndrome. And in the UK, NICE, the uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, lists hypnotherapy at the top of the list of preferred therapies for that condition. So I think it, it is beyond argument that in certain conditions, hypnotherapy is a scientifically validated discipline. In terms of what we're doing here, we all know that NLP is used hugely in business and in industry. It is effective. The Ericksonian roots of NLP are obviously also the roots of what we consider to be modern hypnosis. I think occasionally that NLP can be a little formulaic as it is applied. Um, but I try not to uh, um, not, not, not to use NLP like a machine the way some people do. Um, I, I feel that we do have a great opportunity to prove each of these steps of the program, and that once we've done that, we can claim a scientific validation. The reason that we are delivering the therapy now before we have that validation is purely because there was such a demand for it. And I think that really to have robbed those individuals who benefited from this of therapy for maybe two or three years while we conducted further research would probably have been wrong, perhaps even unethical. Does that sound reasonable, Tom? It does. There's also an element of this research in validating the treatment as a treatment package. And in validating it as, as a, a, a treatment package is to make it an evidence-based practice. Uh, we do not have to, we would not consider all the evidence of acupuncture or meridian therapies that we will be looking to see that we have a person who is at one level of distress for their misophonia, we apply the, the treatment package, you know, how does that affect their level of distress for misophonia? And so there will be research done at both levels, at, at both, you know, as, as Chris showed in the, uh, in the slide where you're trying to see the effects on actual, you know, brain scans, uh, but the, one of the common ways of evaluating a package is to have a, you know, a, a, a study done where you look at the effect of the treatment to see whether it in fact, in fact, it is an effective treatment. If it is, and what level, what is the size of the effect of the treatment? Not just that it's statistically significant, but it's, it has to be meaningful. Yeah, thank okay. you. I'd also mention um, that while I was talking about the prerequisites for training, that I, I did list EFT and the meridian therapies as useful additions, but they're certainly not uh, a bar to taking the training course. And I do respect the views of any individual therapist to use those or not to use them depending on their opinion about the individual disciplines. Um, it, it is something which is, uh, is contentious. If you find, I personally I think if you find EFT works with an individual, then I think that we should, um, we, we, we certainly should consider using it. 
Um, I see there's just been a couple of comments as well, Tom, on previous um, uh, topics. One is in the bar chart, four in the nine patients showed a higher MAQ uh, at follow-up. I did hint while I was presenting that slide that a good deal of that variability could well be, if you like, measurement noise because two or three points on a MAQ2 are really not significant, I think, for most individuals um, and, and possibly even slightly, slightly more um, in, in some instances. Um, but certainly, as I look at it, um, with, with, with all of those, the, even the follow-ups are mostly, well, I would say, with one exception, the follow-ups are markedly and significantly different to the, the intake, and uh, it's really uh, case four um, where I think that there, that there could well be an argument for that being um, all within the range of variability, although I, I know for a fact that that particular person felt better. And I think that uh, the fact that we're also using SUD scores um, to measure their subjective units of distress or discomfort um, show that uh, the response to therapy is that they feel better um, about those um, those issues. Um, I, I'm going to say, I, I think also we're not saying that this is a, a cure for misophonia that will last no matter what. The slide which showed that of the 2013 uh, individuals treated that those who did their daily maintenance had uh, much better results than those who did not. So I don't think we're claiming that this is a slam dunk cure. There, there will be people who will uh, regress in this and that there may need to be follow up. And we've seen people who do not respond to this. this so it's not a, a, a universal, you know, guarantee that, that this is still working, but it, it has a higher, it has a reasonably high rate of positive outcomes and I, I think but there is concern we are concerned and that's why we need to have better follow-up longer follow-up as well as uh, better data with it um mention also about the uh, uh an opportunity to uh, perhaps conduct a, an initial session without a camera and, and to um, and, and to elicit some confidence and, uh, and relaxation in the client before using the camera. Obviously one of the, the real keys to hypnotherapy is to establish a rapport with a client and uh, for them to feel very uh, relaxed and confident. So. Uh, um, that, that, that is something I think that we would address and I think that's uh, an insightful comment to have made. Um, Kim says or asks if there are currently no therapists in the United States um, and, and that is actually the case although uh, we are looking to change that as a situation very soon and I'm hoping that uh, the uh, the Chicago conference in October will give me an opportunity to uh, at, at least make contact with other therapists and, uh, and, and possibly to uh, initiate a training scheme. Okay, any, any last questions that we have from our group? Uh, well, Kim has uh, also mentioned that the time difference is a big issue and I do, I do appreciate that. Um, I've, I've been able to, I think, provide reasonable options for 
American and Australian clients. Um, obviously, with Australia being completely at the opposite end of the, uh, the, the time zone scale to USA, that means that uh, working days can become exceptionally extended. Um, and so far, the only uh, really difficult time zone I've found to work with has been New Zealand, um, which obviously being pretty well 12 hours different does, uh, does create all kinds of uh, issues. But I hope that we'll have some uh, uh, therapists based in the USA in the, in the very near future. All right, that brings it into our, our Q&A and our webinar. So thank you very much for attending and participating in this. Uh, we are just very excited uh, to, to make the, the sequent repatterning treatments available uh, to people who really, who really need it. There are so few treatments for misophonia that are effective. Uh, this really adds great hope. We're not completely there in terms of research, but we are at a point where we understand that this, this does provide uh, effective treatment for many people, and we're happy to provide that. So, Chris, do you want to say a goodbye, and then we'll sign off? Well, thank you, Tom. It's been a pleasure to present this to what seems to have been a, an appreciative panel of uh, participants and I'm really very glad that we've been able to do this. So thank you. Thank you to the participants and I look forward to seeing some at the conference in October and perhaps to meeting some of the others online as time goes by. Right. So as goodbye. Chris and I will both be presenting at the uh, at the October conference. So hope to see you there. Okay. Bye now.